I tell my MBA students all the time, like, work for a different company every semester. Mm -hmm. Just give them like every Friday afternoon for four hours. And there's a good chance that one of those is going to lead to a job offer. And there's a good chance it's going to be a great experience because you know what it's like there. You know what it's like to work for that person. They know what you're like. They're more comfortable making that, that offer. Welcome to the Smart Venture Podcast. We're here to bring you the latest and greatest from the Silicon Valley, where unicorns roam and innovation never sleeps. We've got top investors, superstar founders, and well-known tech executives lined up to share their secrets on building and investing in successful companies. Just a quick disclaimer, while we may sound like financial geniuses, but please don't mistake us for your friendly neighborhood financial advisors. So let's get started and dive into the wild world of tech entrepreneurship. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for coming on to the show today. Yeah, you bet, Grace. Happy to be yeah. here. Uh, so I have to say, I love your book and I read it like actually multiple times by now. Um, I think the book is super interesting, but we'll get there. Um, so let's start with how do you grow up and how do you get into tech? I studied engineering in school. I guess I was always like kind of good at math and was told to go in that direction. And then when I came out of school, my first job was at Accenture writing code. Um, so actually it was on the team that uh, if you've ever sent a package with UPS and mm -hmm. uh, the tracking code, uh, the tracking, we wrote that stuff way back in like 1997 or something. So yeah, I started as an engineer and a, and a programmer. And then um, I was staffed. You know, it's kind of interesting because, you know, when I came out of school in 98, entrepreneurship, the ecosystem was not what it is today. Like none of my friends were talking about being an entrepreneur. Like mm -hmm. no one was talking about starting a company. It was like kind of just into that, like, dot com buzz that was about mm -hmm. to happen that like totally changed the accessibility of entrepreneurship mm -hmm. probably like a year or two into my career i was staffed at a startup by mm -hmm. accenture and that's when i was like mm -hmm. oh my gosh this is awesome mm -hmm. and i just fell in love with entrepreneurship and never looked back i never worked for a big company again so yeah that, I, I ended up in a startup down in in the new york area i ended up going to mit for business school to study entrepreneurship and really mm -hmm. solidify like my place in the ecosystem, I guess. And that's where I met, um, you know, Brian and Darmesh uh, for HubSpot and, mm -hmm. and kind of rolled into that and just landed in sales accidentally. Halligan, uh, the CEO and founder of HubSpot was sort of like, yeah, Mark, um, I'm glad you're helping us one day a week, but I mm -hmm. really just need help with sales. And mm -hmm. so that's how I kind of accidentally fell into the sales world. Yeah, I think I think that's super cool. So what um what make you decided to start up is your thing? Like why not um other stuff? It was a, a bunch of things. Like once I was in that startup ecosystem, it was like wow, like the amount of impact you can have as an individual in a company that you mm -hmm. can't have at a bigger company. Like how mm -hmm. <clears throat> how much impact your organizations happen in terms of the mm -hmm. changes trying to drive, the innovation, the creative process, mm -hmm. the pace. Mm -hmm. the financial upside, the, mm -hmm. just like the, the culture, like every, everything clicked for me. Mm -hmm. Nothing against them. I have friends at bigger companies and like, you mm -hmm. know, bigger company, you, know, you need to build bigger companies, but like, it just wasn't for me. It felt very, I was like so specialized and it felt so like, um, it just wasn't as exciting for me. Mm -hmm. After HubSpot, do you wrote the book during? I think you wrote the book during Hubs uh, HubSpot. Right at the right? end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, right at the end. What was happening was mm -hmm. we had started to get really well known as we were approaching 100 million in revenue. And um, I, used, I started to get a lot of emails from entrepreneurs mm -hmm. asking like, how do you hire salespeople? How do you, how do you sell? How do you mm -hmm. compensate reps? And so I would spend my commute to and from work on the phone mm -hmm. with these entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and they were always the same questions with always the same answers. And I'd get emails after being like, wow, that totally changed my company. Mm -hmm. We implemented it worked really well. So that's really what inspired the book was I should just put this down on paper about how I'm doing these things and it will help mm -hmm. a lot of, a lot of entrepreneurs and, and, and salespeople. I, I never thought it would kind of evolve to be used all around the world to, mm -hmm. to build, to build sales teams. And, um, and then that led to being recruited to Harvard to, to teach, the, to build out those co the courses in the MBA level. But yeah, now, now I'm writing a new book on something that's a little more extract on like how fast mm -hmm. you should be scaling. But yeah, the book, mm -hmm. the sales acceleration formula was, 
was about how I did at HubSpot. Yeah. Well, what's the title of the new book? Well, I'm hoping it will be the science of scaling. That's what I've been <clears throat>、uh, on stage talking about、um, mm-hmm. for a couple of years,、um, mm-hmm. and I, it, it is in a 40-page ebook right now on、mm-hmm. the Stage Two Capital, my my、mm-hmm. venture capital firm's website. So yeah, I hope it's the science of scaling, and it、um, instructs entrepreneurs when they're ready to scale and how fast. Yeah,、um, so I'm super excited about this new book.、Um, so after you wrote the book, and then Harvard asked you to teach the、um, the MBA level course, like tell us more about like how do you de- develop the course? Yeah, a lot of it was around the book. I mean, I right now it's kind of evolved over many years. Right now, it's、mm-hmm. in the form of entrepreneurial sales, and we have、mm-hmm. five modules that we run. So the first module is about teaching the students how to sell.、Mm-hmm. Um, so like, how do you do discovery calls? How do you do demos?、Mm-hmm. How do you close? Kind of like founder selling, because a lot of them want to be founders. The second module is how do you build the first team,、mm-hmm. right? So how do you build the revenue plan? How do you hire? We do interviews with salespeople, like we bring in salespeople and actually have them do a job interview.、Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you do data driven management and coaching? How do you coach reps? How do you set up your first forecast, right?、Mm-hmm. Then then we move into scaling the team, that module, and that's like comp design, territory design, like. Having multiple channels to to acquire customers, setting up a post、uh, a BDR team, setting up a CSM team, that kind of stuff. Then we do a fourth module on international sales. So we do a case in Japan,、uh, Saudi Arabia, France,、mm-hmm. and Brazil,、mm-hmm. uh, and then、uh, we end up with a module on. Selling and non-sales roles. So, if、mm-hmm. you're a venture capital partner <laughs> and you need to win a deal, how do you do that?、Mm-hmm. If you're a management consultant at McKinsey. And you're selling a big account. How do you do that? If you're a founder and you're raising money, how do you do that? So these are all、mm-hmm. situations that require sales, but、mm-hmm. the person's title is not sales. You know? Yeah, I think、um, the the、yeah. situation sales sounds super interesting. Would、yeah. love to. Yeah, like would love to one day have you talk about it on the podcast or something. Yeah, for sure, for sure.、Uh, yeah, so many listeners are actually like either young VCs or people trying to raise fund.、Um, mm. So I feel like it's、uh, it's super. It could be super helpful for for the listeners.、Nice. Um, yeah, so I think you had a great career in a center to a startup to eventually you biggest network probably is in MIT where you met the the co founders of HubSpots.、Um, so curious on you know how do you create. A, a, a network for yourself, and、mm. if you have a board for yourself,、mm. like who is on the on the board member? That's a good question. I guess I do have a board, I suppose. So yeah, I like I like how you frame that with the board, your own personal <laughs> board. Have you been talking about that a lot? That's a really cool concept. You're the first person I ask.、Um, oh my gosh, yeah, you gotta you gotta you gotta keep pushing on that. That's a very cool thing. You should write about that. Yeah, I think.、Um, I watched your talk at Google.、Um, yeah. Like I think Rich Miner、uh, host yeah. hosted, yeah. and like I feel like also when you mentioned about like you know back in time startup wasn't really a thing. So I'm also curious about you know how do you kind of get into it, and then、uh, you know did you start it surrounded yourself with a lot of founders back in time, and who are those people now today? Yeah. So.、Um... That, that I think that's a, a really impactful, th- important thing that I did that I think、mm-hmm. anyone could do is you know remember at the beginning of HubSpot,、mm-hmm. you know I'm the first salesperson, the fourth、mm-hmm. employee, and I've never sold before, right? I've never I've never、mm-hmm. run a sales team before. I went out and basically I probably invested even though you're you're working eighty hours a week,、mm-hmm. I I invested five probably about five percent of my time on personal development. Mm-hmm. Which was like reading books, reading blogs, and meeting、mm-hmm. sales leaders for coffee.、Mm-hmm. I probably met a different sales leader every week, which、mm-hmm. was cool. Like they they were pretty they're pretty open to meeting me for coffee, which is、mm-hmm. great. And over that year, I had assembled about ten people of those sales leaders that I wanted to spend more time with. That I、mm-hmm. wish we had more time. And it was interesting because they. M- All of them were more like peers as opposed to mentors. Like、right. they were, because I think we were、mm-hmm. going through a pretty, pretty big change in sales at the time. Like all the potential、mm-hmm. mentors had built like big outside teams at places like SAP and Oracle,、mm-hmm. and it just wasn't as applicable to the hubs, the new HubSpot model we were trying to do.、Mm-hmm. Versus the people that I really gravitated to were folks that were at LinkedIn and Google and like some、mm-hmm. of these newer. 
companies that were more like my age and my level. So mm-hmm. I basically um, assembled a peer dinner um, mm-hmm. of, again, none of these people were at my company. Mm-hmm. They were at other places and there was like 10 of us on the list. And every quarter we did a dinner mm-hmm. and um, usually like six to eight of us would show up. And we caught up, had a cocktail, and then everybody went around the table and said the biggest problem they're having. Mm -hmm. And then we went back around the table and worked on everyone's problem for like 20 minutes. It was like a three, four hour dinner, but that's probably where I learned the most about sales. Um, Mm -hmm. It's just like working on each other's problems, hearing what people had gone through or are going through. Mm -hmm. And um, we did that for like eight years. And and a lot of people, yeah, the... (laughs) pretty much everyone at that table had, had great success. You know, the founder, like the person that ran sales at Dine, the gentleman that ran Google's office when Google first started their Boston, the gentleman that ran AOL's team that, you know, AOL mm-hmm. sounds like a, a sleepier brand, but they actually did quite well uh, in, in content, mm-hmm. you know, just like a really gr- group of successful people. That, that was one that I think everyone should do. Everyone should assemble their own peer group and foster mm-hmm. a, a monthly or quarterly conversation, whether you're a customer success manager, a BDR, account executive, a sales manager, a VP, a CRO, whatever, um, that I think that would be really valuable, especially mm-hmm. these days, you just do it over Zoom if you don't want to do it in person. But mm-hmm. um, the other thing is over those years, I did actually find a mentor. I don't know if I was necessarily looking for one, but um, <laughs> it, I think it takes a long time to find a person that like, mm-hmm you have to be open to it. They have to be at a stage in their career where they want to do it. And then there needs to be a chem- chemistry. And so um, I met John McMahon, who he, he actually ironically was Halligan's boss at PTC. So PTC is a, you know, a CAD software company. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had scaled them as head of global sales from a hundred million in revenue to a billion in revenue. So mm-hmm. he had seen so much and, and especially as we started to get to like 30, 50, 70 million, it was harder for me to see what challenges were ahead for me. Mm-hmm. And so I spent four hours a month with him. Like he would always come in to the office for half a day and we just, he just hammer away at what's going on. And I still have a really great relationship with him. Like he, mm-hmm. he taught me a ton about sales. Yeah. So those were like the professional ones. Now all that's changed. I don't, I don't see the peer group as much anymore because they're mm-hmm. all doing different things. And now I'm teaching and doing venture capital. Uh, I still work a little bit with my mentor, John, but not as much in that way. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that changed to like mentors and helping me teach at Harvard. You know, I had a, mm-hmm. a bunch of different teachers there and now, now moving into more of the venture capital scene. Mm-hmm. And then just personally on my board, like the other big thing is personally, you know, I've, I've struggled in my life with anxiety um, mm-hmm. over, the years are like really debilitating mm-hmm. and uh, I take medication for it, which is like really helped me. And now it's, it's in great control. I, my first bout was uh, uh, I was kind of involved in nine 11 down in New York. So that caused that triggered initially, but uh, I also have a therapist that I've seen for like 10 years. So that's a very important wow. member of my board is uh, is, you know, even when my life is going well, I'll still talk to my therapist, like, at least twice a month just to keep him up to speed with how things are going. So that's, mm-hmm. that's a key, key member of my board. <laughs> wow. That's so interesting. How do you find the therapist? That's uh, that's good. introduction from a good friend. I was going through a really rough time and um, my, he was my friend's therapist. <laughs> nice. So, yeah. And yeah. So curious about the peer group. So this is not the first time I heard about this. Yeah. When I was doing my second book, I was interviewing VCs. Someone said the same thing, sort of like they have like a 25 people group eating pizza every week and uh, talking about career development. So I'm just curious about, you know, when you are putting together this team, do people like each time it's not everybody show up? How do you, I feel like if I run this thing, I feel like the third week will be dying down just because what if no one show up and no one consistently show up? Do people just change or are they like the same people from the beginning to the end? Oh, they can change. Yeah. You have to like, at least the way I did it, right. Mm -hmm. There was, it was a list of between 10 and 15 people. Mm -hmm. And I would say like, Honestly, eight was too many at the dinner mm-hmm. and four to five was perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, two or three, it was like, 
yeah, it was fine, but it was just like, it was, it was just not as much energy. Yeah. Cause you can really dig in when you have eight, there's just a lot to cover in that time. And like mm-hmm. everyone wants to, so that, that's, that's just for that format. Right. And so mm-hmm. if you had 10 to 15 people on the list, you know, sales, you're always traveling and stuff, but we could, I usually book them like six weeks out. Right. Mm-hmm. So, and the fact that it was only happening once a quarter, people prioritized it. So if mm-hmm. it was happening every week, I agree, it would have probably lost its steam. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, it changed because some people like sold their company and like went and did something else and they really didn't, it shouldn't be in the group anymore. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then we'd find new people. Right. But mm-hmm. it was never like, sometimes they were like, Hey, I got, a, I got someone that should be in the group. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't just like let someone in because it started like David Scott at, at Matrix and other VCs heard I was running it. And they're like, hey, can we can we get this person into it? Mm-hmm. And I would always like um, say no, but then have a coffee or a dinner one on one with them first to vet them. Because mm-hmm. that that like that the synergy, it wasn't like a stranger could just come in. It was like a, it was mm-hmm. a real it was a relationship that we want to test out to make mm-hmm. sure they fit. That's just that's just the model that I used for it. You know, I'm sure it can be done in more frequently with bigger numbers, whatever, but that's that's the model that I preferred. Yeah. Um, so that's uh that's super cool. But like I feel like also it's really hard to get people to share what's actually going on because like I feel like there's a lot of things could be confidential about what the company is doing, whatever the company they work for is doing, kind of. Um, I don't know if you have any challenges on that. Uh, actually- no, we had a great deal of trust with each other. I mean, of course, mm-hmm. like if someone was public, they had to be careful. They, they couldn't share anything like, mm-hmm. so, so, like the numbers and stuff. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we got, we got into it, you know, like my boss sucks. Like, you know, like I got to fire this one person. Like this is happening. Like, you know, we got deep into it. And so, there has to be, you know, and we would say like, listen, when new people came, like, listen, we're going to, we're going to open up about some deep stuff and it, it stays at this table. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, so that, that level of trust is important. That's why I think these people need to be vetted too. And, mm-hmm. and, and we had that trust with each other. Yeah, totally. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I'll give it a try. <laughs> I nice. hope yeah, I can run more than four, four times. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I think you should, yeah. Grace. I think you'll, you'll do great with it. Thank you. Uh, so let's like move on to like your career journey. So uh, I think your major sale, like major like career acceleration is with HubSpot, I assume. Yeah. Um, so tell us more about like, you know, how do you meet the team? What do you thought about the, the team? So I know you're the force employee. What yeah. did they have back then? I know you were working on your own startup before joining, yeah. them, right? Tell us more about how, like the joining journey. Why do you pick them? And like, what do you see in this? Uh, whole yeah, thing? I don't think there's a lot to learn uh, from <laughs> other people because it was so <laughs> lucky and serendipitous and not intended. I mean, I went to MIT for business school to start a company. Mm-hmm. I worked with a lot of different startups during that journey. Mm-hmm. And I ended up starting my own company halfway through. Like you, you know, most business mm-hmm. schools, you do two years and there's a summer in between. So mm-hmm. I uh, started, I raised like a million bucks for a startup idea mm-hmm. early in the social networking arena. Like Facebook was really just coming out then. And I, I didn't go through the interview process and didn't go for a job after school. I I continued to do, mm-hmm. you know, the, the startup mm-hmm. and I was, um, uh, Darmesh, one of the co-founders mm-hmm. at HubSpot, I sat next to him in class mm-hmm. and we started to, he was doing a start, his, he was doing HubSpot mm-hmm. at the time. <laughs> it was, it was a class that you start a company. So I was starting my social mm-hmm. networking company. He was starting HubSpot and we really hit it off and we would grab like, you know, food together every other week or so. And Mm -hmm. I asked him, he had had some success with a startup before. So I asked if he'd be willing to invest in my idea and he did. Mm -hmm. And he's like, just one, one item though, is I need you to help me with HubSpot one day a week. So I'll pay you as a consultant. You could probably use the money and you go work on your startup six days a week and help me one day a week. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, okay, perfect. That sounds awesome. So that's how I got introduced to HubSpot. And I would, Mm -hmm. It was a very different, it was a different idea back then. And I would strategize with Darmesh. And then uh, he was working, Brian Halligan had done some work with, he was also at MIT and Mm -hmm. he and and Darmesh had really hit it off. Mm -hmm. And and Darmesh had finally convinced Brian, he was, he went into venture capital after 
to quit venture capital and come run HubSpot because Dharmesh didn't mm-hmm. want to run it. And so um, that's how I met Brian. And, and Dharmesh was like, oh, by the way, we got this guy, Mark, that comes by every Thursday and helps us out. And Brian's like, well, let me, let me see what this guy's all about. And he met me and he's like, I like you, but um, if you're going to help us every week, I don't need strategy help. I need sales help. <laughs> mm-hmm. So uh, I'll still pay you as a consultant, but um, just go sell customers for us. Mm-hmm. And so that's how I kind of got into sales um, is he just asked me to do that. And, and that was fine. Um, and then um, my, after about a year, I was really struggling with my startup. I was struggling mm-hmm. to get my next round. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, Brian and Dharmesh did not know that, but Brian mm-hmm. was being very aggressive around trying to recruit me because I, mm-hmm. I, was, I was selling HubSpot pretty well uh, one mm-hmm. day a week. And he was like, you should come full-time quit your startup and build build, the sales team. <laughs> build our startup <laughs> yeah build, build this one because we're about to raise a series a and we're about to go from four employees to like eight employees so now would be a mm-hmm. good time to come in you know so i was desperate at the time because my startup was mm-hmm. falling apart and i didn't tell brian that because i wanted to negotiate a good deal for myself mm-hmm. so he took me to the red sox game i remember he has really nice seats in the front row and then uh mm-hmm. we struck a deal uh for me to come on full-time and uh, yeah, so I honestly did not, it's, it's not like I was like mm-hmm. analyzing the startup. I was really just kind of desperate thinking that I'd have a paycheck for six months and get my life back together. But you know, it, it was nice that I guess one lesson that comes from that, and I've done this, I encourage a lot of people to do this, is if you're in a position career-wise to do a rent before you buy situation, that's hugely advantageous. Like mm-hmm. you know, a lot of my peers who like, um, you know, they have an exit or they quit or whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm like, don't, don't like go do like a week of interview and then pick a company and go full time. Don't like, especially if you want to play in the startup ecosystem, like mm-hmm. work for three different startups at the same time, like give them a day a week and just like go earlier than you would want to uh, in terms of stage. And cause that was huge for me to be, have worked with Brian and Darmesh for nine months. Mm-hmm as a one day a week before I jumped in, I knew the company, I knew the product, I knew them, I knew how they worked. They knew me. Mm-hmm. Right? It's like, so you, you're not always in that setting, but if you can do the rent before, even for students, like I tell my MBA students all the time, like work for a different company every semester, mm-hmm. just give them like every Friday afternoon for four hours. And there's a good chance that one of those is going to lead to a job offer. And there's a good chance it's going to be a great experience because you know what it's like there. You know what it's like to work for that person. They know what you're like. They're more comfortable making that, that offer. So I guess that's the one thing that wasn't just luck is I did mm-hmm. have a rent before buy option to mm-hmm. get into that job. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you help HubSpot grow from a four people team to um, whatever it is now. I think it's a quite a success. And I feel like as an early hire or um, basically a co-founder with the team, you definitely contribute a lot. Um, tell us more about the experience growing from like a four people team to, you know, nine years later, it become a huge company. Like what are some different phases that you went through? And what, what are some moments that you feel like you grew as a different leader each time? Kind of. Yeah. You always have to like I guess they kind of come in like nine month sequences, especially on the sales side. Mm-hmm. And you, you always have to be thinking pretty far ahead. And I guess I'm, I, I'm fortunate in the sense that I guess I have a little bit of career, career mm-hmm. ADD. Like I don't, I get bored of roles pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. So I'm always trying to get to the next thing. And that was mm-hmm. actually kind of perfect for this because mm-hmm. your role was really had to be redefined almost every year or six mm-hmm. months. Right. So, I mean, simplistically in the beginning, it was like, mm-hmm you're the only seller, so you're selling. Mm -hmm. But you're also preparing for sales manager because you're building the dashboards, you're building the formula, you're building Mm -hmm. the playbooks, right? So Mm -hmm. if all I had to do is sell by myself ever, I wouldn't have taken time to document the discovery call guide and the prospecting guide. But I Mm -hmm. knew that I wanted to get, we wanted to get to the next phase. So I was Mm -hmm. spending like three quarters of my time selling and a quarter Mm -hmm. of my time codifying, right? Mm -hmm. And so then you become sales manager Mm -hmm. and you got to pull yourself... A lot of entrepreneurs don't let the, the whoever they're going to turn into sales manager, mm-hmm. they don't let them let go of their quota, but you got to. It's mm-hmm. so, 
as sales manager, you do three things. You hire people, you coach them, and you, you drive them toward the activity and forecast. That's mm -hmm. what a sales manager does. They don't do selling. Like mm -hmm. they shouldn't even, I don't even like my sales managers to be on the sales calls. I like them to listen to recordings. I like them to debrief and prep with their reps, but I don't, they, I don't want them driving the sales call. That's not going to mm -hmm. scale. So, so I had to pretty quickly like remove myself and Halligan understood that I could remove myself mm -hmm. from an individual quota. And my new quota was hire one rep a month for the next mm -hmm. eight months and get to like bigger revenue numbers. Right. And so, so that, so now you're a sales manager and you're hiring, you're coaching. Um, and you're also thinking, how am I going to build new sales managers? Cause I can't mm -hmm. be the only sales manager forever. So now I'm like codifying the coaching playbook. I'm, and I'm also developing managers right so the last thing you want is to like be coming up in march and you're like holy cow now we have 12 reps mm -hmm. i can't manage 12 reps i need a manager we're going to go from 12 to 16 reps in the next couple months mm -hmm. i need a manager you can't be like who do i like you have to really prepare for that you mm -hmm. hope you have to be in a position where it's like you got three people training and ready to go and you pick one mm -hmm. right so so what i did was i developed a management training program that was nine mm -hmm. months long right mm -hmm. so it's like a lot of my reps would and it wasn't like it wasn't a lot of work I, i've i've mm -hmm. written a blog article about it and it's in the book mm -hmm. i really just picked like you know 10 leadership articles that people mm -hmm. read just to understand things like how to handle conflict how to build team spirit how to deliver feedback effectively how to you know you know these these are the leadership things i needed to teach my future managers to do so I just had them read one of those every week and then we'd role play some things. That's all it was. But I got mm -hmm. to see like how they operated and then I gave them their own sales hire before they officially got promoted just to mm -hmm. so they can go through the interview process and the onboarding mm -hmm. process. So, so I built this management development process. So when my reps join and like, I want to be a manager, I'm like, great. I already have a process. Here's how you become a manager. One, hit your quota for five months mm -hmm. in a row. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do it with a, a, a great, uh, exceptional, like uh, demonstration of every aspect of the sales process. Mm -hmm. Once you do that, I'll put you in the training program and that's going to go for like three months. And then if you get through that and you still want to be a manager, I'm going to give you a hire uh, and you're going to go through interviewing and, and, and training that person. And if that goes well, then I'll make you a manager mm -hmm. when the next slot opens up. So mm -hmm. uh, over time I had like eight people go active in the training program at any time. So mm -hmm. when we were scaling and I had a new management position open up, it was very easy for me to like, oh, this person's ready. Mm -hmm. They've been, I've been working with them on management training for like six months. They are ready. Mm -hmm. I plucked them out and it didn't piss everyone else off. Mm -hmm. Like if I picked, you know, Susan mm -hmm. and Bob's like, what the heck? Why did Susan get picked? Like, because Susan is at the end of the process. You're on step mm -hmm. three. Mm -hmm. Right. So it was a great way to, and so that, that's an important thing to develop. And then, you know, I would say like, I would call that maybe being a director and then eventually your VP where now you have to develop, you know, get to a point where I had people under me mm -hmm. that were VPs that had organized people that had 80 people working for them. Right. So it's like, you're, you're developing a new level of leadership that's more strategic and challenge them on how they run that type of an operation. So mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of like, you're always trying to think like six to 12 months ahead and be, and being ready for that. Absolutely. Um, but I think another thing is your startup is also powered for growth. Like your other co-founders are also doing their job but like as a startup founder sometimes your um you know your company is not growing as fast as hubspot um so it's not really like i have a consistency growth um so if it's a really early stage company how do you hire from like you know one person to uh two people and then you know trying yeah. To, yeah like if you're so i i remember in your book you mentioned that you know a lot of you know, sales leader in Boston owns your favor. So you go after whoever quit their company and ask them to pick from them, right? So I feel like those are, those shows that you already have a network. And as someone, maybe your student who is still in business school, how do they yeah. kind of creating something that's um, meaningful for them? And I mean, you still have mentors, like those first, um, if you're talking that early, Grace, like your mm -hmm. zero to five people, you're not putting a post on Indeed or LinkedIn for a job opening. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is coming heavily from your network. And even if you're like a 
22 year old undergrad student, like, fine, there's a lot of professors that are there to help you. There's a lot of like incubators out there. Um, there's a lot of people that want to mentor you. And, and that's where it needs to come from is just like networking and meeting people. And uh, again, I would say, um, if possible, try the rent before buy on that side too. Mm -hmm. Like you all, you can't, you can't always do that, but it's like, you know, if I was, if I was looking for a technical founder and they're working at like Google or Facebook, mm -hmm. like I would rather they, you know, we do nights and weekends for two months together first mm -hmm. before they quit their job and came on board. Cause that those first hires, like that's, that's the number one killer of startups mm -hmm. at that stage is team. Mm -hmm. It's just the, team dynamics, the hiring the wrong people, fights, all that kind of stuff. So, mm -hmm. so that, that's a very important decision. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you. And so you mentioned a lot uh, from the sales leader perspective, you're looking for someone who is, has the coachability, who is curious and all that. So as a young salesperson, if someone is trying to get into sales or someone who is currently doing sales, how should they stand out from the crowd to hire, to be hired by you or, uh, you know, a, a sales leader? Yeah. I mean, some of the better newer folks are like, take their own career development in their own hands. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're out there. There's, there's so many tools now with like, you know, online education and stuff where you can go and just read a lot, practice, you know, take, take online classes, et cetera. That's the best thing you can do. Um, you know, I would say the biggest misconception of selling is people think it's about a provocative pitch, like being outgoing and like, you know, the jock and good looking and like, you know, very convincing. That's not it at all. Mm -hmm. It's about, it's about getting the buyer to trust you mm -hmm. quickly and then leveraging that trust with open-ended questions to understand the buyer's perspective. That's, mm -hmm. that's selling. You know, it's like I joke with my students often is like, you know, next time, well, in COVID it's hard, but like <laughs> next time you're at like a networking event or a wedding or even like, you know, go over to a stranger and see how long you can ask them questions before they get pissed off. <laughs> Cause that, that's like, honestly, the best way I could summarize great sales personship mm -hmm. is like, if you can, like, I can go over to these people, meet a total stranger and ask them questions for like half an hour and they don't feel interrogated and they don't get pissed off. And in fact, at some point they're like, I can tell that I'm like reframing their perspective because they'll be like, you know, that's a great question. No one's ever asked me that question before. And that is like the highest form of sales is you can, through questions, you can reframe someone's perspective, right? You know, I've had people like go over to their wife after and be like, you know, I didn't even tell them anything but my name. And they were like, that guy, Mark, he's, he's a, an amazing guy. <laughs> and all I did was ask them a bunch of questions, right? So that, you know, if, if you try to get down to like, what is early on, that's the skill set you're trying to, to establish. Mm -hmm. um, I find it really hard to switch into sales after you chat with someone on a personal mindset. Like you ask them a lot of questions, but when it comes to, hey, I have a solution for you. Here is our product. I feel like I don't know how to kind of like make the transition. Sure. We can, we can work on that right now. So basically you want to build a little rapport mm -hmm. so that like they trust you. And I like to frame, I want to get the buyer talking. Mm -hmm. And most of the time it's as easy as like, Hey, why did you take this meeting with me? Mm -hmm. Like more than half of the buyers will just start. This is what's going on. I, <laughs> let's, let's take, let's take HubSpot as an example. Like, let's, oh, I took the meeting with you because you know, we, we're, we can't grow. We can't get the demand gen going. Mm -hmm. And you know, then you just, you're constantly just like, dive into that. Well, what do you mean? What have you tried? Oh, we, we've tried did paid marketing. We've tried cold calling. Nothing's working. You're like, why do you think? Why not? What happened with the cold calling? Why did that not work? What do you want to try? What have you, you know, and of course I know what I want. Like average salespeople will stop right there. And be like, I got what, I got what you need. <laughs> but no, no, I want them to, I want to completely establish. I want them to be like closing themselves. Right. So like, so 
well, what do you think you want to try? I'm like, well, a lot of times I'll be like, I want to try blogging. I'm like, well, why? Why do you want to try blogging and inbound? What do you mean by that? Well, I just, I know we're getting creamed on the Google rankings. I'm like, okay, so, so you want to blog so you can get high ranks and what would success look like? Like how many leads do you need? Well, you know, we really need to like double our lead flow by the end of the year. And what's the lead flow now? We're getting like a hundred a month. Okay. So you need 200 a month. You're telling me that you need 200 leads a month. And the way you want to do it is you want to blog to do it. Who's going to blog and how often? Um, I'm not really sure. Maybe you could help me with that. Yeah, yeah, I'll help you with that. Not right now, but I'll, I can help you understand that. And like, would you be willing to spend? So, so basically, this is the, this is the transition the point, Grace. This is the transition that you're asking about is, okay, Grace, thank you, for tell, thank you for sharing all that with me. Let me just make sure I have it right. You uh, can't scale a company because you can't scale demand gen. You've tried paid marketing and you've tried cold calling and neither of them worked. And you think it's because your buyer is resistant to those and they're more online and intelligent. So what you want to do is you want to stand up a, a blog, possibly like two articles a week with the hopes that um, it will increase your Google ranks and that will uh, double your lead flow. Cause you got to get from 100 to 200 leads yeah. by the end of the year. Do I have that right? Um, and um, would you be willing to spend, say, 15000 a year to do that, right? I haven't told you anything about my product yet. Mm -hmm. All I've done is framed your problem. And I even, I even frame, like, how much you might be willing to spend. And, and then, like, and I might even say, like, if I can show you that, how to do that, and it's something that's going to cost you 15000 a year, would you want to do that? So I didn't even show you my product yet. I just, all I did was like, I framed your problem mm -hmm. and then asked if, if I solved that for this amount, would you do it? And then I'll, now all I have to do is show you what I have. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Like I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's super smooth. <laughs> um, so when you, so like you mentioned about like online courses, what classes do you recommend besides your class and your book? <laughs> Which are well, you got it. You, Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. The, the, there's the one at HubSpot on the inbound. We get, we have a lot of mm -hmm. um, inbound sales certification, that kind of stuff. I don't know. Like, I haven't really looked hardcore at the classes. Um, I would say, you know, I like, I just like consuming content. Some of the books are good because by the time you write a book, um, you've codified it pretty well. My, I think the old school, like, my favorite, like, three are pretty old school. Like, mm -hmm. how, have you ever read um, how, to how to Win Friends, win and, friends and Influence People yeah, by Dale yeah, Carnegie? Yeah, yeah, I love that. I mean, that's so good. And it was, it was written in like 1930. Yeah. You know, absolutely. like selling to selling cash registers. Mm -hmm. And you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. so, so that's just a really good foundational one mm -hmm. to understand the basics there. Then I would say spin selling written in the 80s. Mm -hmm. we, yeah, and we use I mean. these at Harvard when we're teaching frameworks. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great one to understand how to navigate the discovery. Mm -hmm. Challenger sales, the big one these days, which is good. You know, a lot of people like it. I just, my only concern, it's like teach, tailor, take control. I think that's a good framework with the challenger mm -hmm. sale. My only concern is I think people on the surface, challenger sale, they interpret it as like, don't worry about discovery, just like, tell the buyer what they need and hope that they buy. And mm -hmm. it's just don't, don't misinterpret challenger sale for that. Cause that, that can like really cause the industry to not do too well, you know? And then I just like, I like, you know, I, I think some of the, the thoughtful um, sales software organizations um, like sales loft and outreach right now, put out some really good content. I think um, I'm trying to think who else. Yeah. I, I just, I kind of read up on that stuff, especially like sales loft and outreach because they're promoting more selling mm -hmm. behaviors, right? Um, uh, and they're doing a pretty good job. Winning by Design is doing a really good job, mm -hmm. Jocko, in framing some of this stuff. Um, but yeah, so I like, I like to just start by like um, following people that I like their content and mm -hmm. then see who they mention and then I follow them. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I just, I feel like I get more out of like the, the incremental blog and ebook reading than mm -hmm. I do just like going through courses or reading full, full books all the time. You know? mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you transitioned out of HubSpot a while ago and you were teaching at Harvard and then now you have your own font stage capital. Um, yeah. Tell us more about 
uh, what's the transition like? And then like, tell us more about like, how do you kind of created this um, concept of a concept of uh, having these B2B uh, uh, software executives um, invest? Yeah, I guess, Grace, I've been like, uh, becoming more of like a Buddhist lifestyle <laughs> in the last like, eight years, because like, as I look back on everything from like, going into sales, going to HubSpot, writing the book, going to Harvard, starting a venture capital firm. I didn't try to do any of that. Like I didn't like say I was going to, I didn't tr purposely do that. It's all things that like landed on my, like mm -hmm. it, on my lap. And I just, Oh, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so I, I very much just like, I guess my common theme is whatever I can do to help the entrepreneur ecosystem because the entrepreneur ecosystem has done a lot for me and I'm passionate for entrepreneurship. So anything I can do to help within the confines of my available time, because I'm mm -hmm. you know, also a dad and I like to golf and try to stay healthy and like all that kind of stuff. So I try, I work hard to try to deliver on it, but you know, that's everything kind of fell on my lap. So I had been helping at Harvard and then they just approached me and said, would you ever consider joining the faculty toward the end of my tenure at HubSpot? So that seemed like a really humbling opportunity and I've been really much enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I took advantage and would help startups uh, every quarter. I'd help one startup every quarter. And that led to me meeting a lot of venture capitalists and that led to me meeting my co-partner for Stasia Capital, Jay Poe, who was at Bessemer. Mm -hmm. at the time. And he was like, we should start the first VC firm run back by sales leaders. Mm -hmm. And I never thought I'd be a VC or start a VC firm. But mm -hmm. I was like, that is a very powerful idea because a lot of the VCs are great at product and finance and strategy, but there's mm -hmm. not a lot of VCs that come from sales. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of really important things to figure out on the sales side in a startup. And I think because this doesn't exist, there's a much higher mm -hmm. failure rate than is necessary. So we went out and the first fund, we had 97 heads of sales as our backers from Dropbox and Salesforce and LinkedIn and Zoom and Asana and Drift and mm -hmm. all the big names. And uh, now we're raising our second fund. We have pretty close to like 150 sales leaders involved now. So yeah, that's all. And in we invest when the companies are roughly around a million in revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, usually we invest when they're not actually raising. Uh, they just need help with their sales team. And the thing that we look at way differently than most is I find that a lot of investors put a major premium on how fast you're growing revenue. Mm -hmm. And I think that is in the early days, that's at the, that can be problematic. And it's mm -hmm. more about how strong your attention is with your customers. So we, we really lean into how you're doing with the retention and we'll help you speed up your revenue. Mm -hmm. So as most, I think most investors, if you're growing 200% revenue, they're very interested in investing. Mm -hmm. But for me, if you're doing that and your retention's not great, uh, I just feel like you don't have a real company. And I, I think that's kind of a pivot and a restart versus if you're only growing, if you have awesome retention, like 90% of your customers, mm -hmm and you're only growing 50%, I'm probably really interested because <laughs> mm -hmm. I've had a lot of you know, success and our team has had a lot of success in accelerating that and, mm -hmm. and building a very strong company with that foundation. Mm -hmm. Would you say they have to have their products ready and then like they already demonstrate that this yeah. product will not fail and then you um, sort of like accelerate on the sales side? Yeah, because the seed funds do well with helping you build engineering and product, right? We're looking for product market fit and we have a very clear definition of product market fit. It's not a million in revenue. It's that you consistently retain your customers. Mm -hmm. I have a f like a, a framework, like a, just a definition of it is like key percent mm -hmm. of customers achieve E event in T time, right? Mm -hmm. So like... So Slack would be like 80% of customers send 2,000 team messages within 30 days. If that happens, you have product market fit. How, Dropbox, if 85% of customers set up, back up their files on one device within one hour, product market mm -hmm. fit. HubSpot, this was actually the real one. 75% of customers use five or more features in the platform within 60 days, product market fit. Right, so like just we... Product market fit changed the world of eco the ecosystem thanks to Eric mm -hmm. Reese's work. But everyone says I'm not going to scale to a product market fit, but everyone has a different definition of product market fit, and oftentimes mm -hmm. it's a, it's around revenue, and I think that's completely wrong.
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I feel like this is a, such a great concept to create like sales leader back to venture capital firm. How do you currently sort of like generating deals? I, I, I know that they probably come to you, but how do you yeah. um, select? So you mentioned some criteria. Tell us more about like what's the most recent deal that you invested in that you can talk about, um, of course. <sighs> Yeah, we just the last deal, we did 11 deals in fund one. The last one we did was GoSite, uh, which we announced that's a San Diego company. They're doing amazing. Their, their, their funnel has accelerated since COVID. Um, they basically help really small companies go online, like plumbers and landscapers and stuff. They set them up with their first like website and help like mm -hmm. online booking to make an appointment and like payments online and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, first off, more than half our deal flow comes from our investors. Right. Mm -hmm. So this one came from, uh, who brought this in? Jason Finger. Jason's been an investor with us for a long time. He was the mm -hmm. founder of Seamless Grubhub, um, first investor in Blue Apron. And he's just really tapped in, in the, especially in the Southwest, you know, Southern California. It's the traditional stuff of, of diligence is important. Team, market size, like moat development, you know, the competition, the, 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 the risk factors that are in there. But again, we look very closely at retention and they had super strong retention and they were also already growing fast and I, all the other boxes checked out. Um, I would say like another area that I don't think the ecosystem has a good definition around is on the moat, the barrier to entry. I think when you, when someone is getting the early traction the, and you're like, okay, well, how do, how come someone, doesn't just copy this mm -hmm. and you're like, what is your moat? Mm -hmm. Most entrepreneurs say it's a product feature. And then I'm like, okay, well, why can't someone build that in like six months? And they're like, well, they can. So that's not a moat. <laughs> that's not a moat. You know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, it, ha it needs to be truly sustainable. There's often like network effects. There's, this brand can actually be a moat, you know, for HubSpot, that was kind of the moat was the inbound as a, as a, as a brand. It's mm -hmm. like they, they owned inbound marketing and inbound mm -hmm. and anytime, and everyone wanted to do inbound and anytime a competitor tried to say, Oh, we're inbound too. It just fueled our demand. Like if you're going to do inbound, you're going to do it with the creators of inbound, you know, for Dropbox, it's more of a network effect, right? Like mm -hmm. when people are sharing stuff, same with Slack, it's more of a network effect. That's mm -hmm. a good moat with Salesforce. They have a bit of a network effect with their app exchange. Right? Like that's like a platform play. That's a true moat. Amazon has a moat that's more like economies of scale. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like they can do prime and they can, they can get you the stuff in two days and they can get it for cheap because they have so much volume. So that's a pure economies of scale play. Right. So like we, I don't think we have a good enough understanding of what true moats are in the ecosystem. Yeah, totally. I think you sort of like build up this um, inbound lead generation whole program. You mentioned about hiring journalists and then you created these top sales program. How does that translate into your own fund right now? So I saw there was, uh, you know, like a, some like booklet that you can download for free. I feel like those are, mm -hmm. you know, the free yeah. kind of generating leads. Yeah, we used, we used content marketing inbound for, for this, the venture capital firm too. And it went really mm -hmm. well. Um, so you know, the whole point, you have to think about what are you trying to achieve? And we're trying to probably attract three different types of people. We're trying to attract entrepreneurs for investing. Uh, we want to see deals. We're trying to uh, attract new investors, right? So people who are successful sales execs that want to be an LP. But there's a minimum threshold of investment that, not, that isn't accessible to everyone. So we also have this other group called the Emerging Leader Syndicate, um, which is people who will be of that level in say five or 10 years, mm -hmm. but they still have a lot to offer to the ecosystem. They want to learn to invest. They want to, they want to help with the companies, et cetera. So we have, we put 30 new members into that every quarter. So we have 60 in there. Now we're going to go to 90 this quarter. Uh, these are the rising stars from like gone and like zoom mm -hmm. and like drift and like Asana and like the companies that are like the next big successes. I mean, zoom's already, already there. They're unbelievable. And we put them through an investing school. We have a 12 week mm -hmm. investing school that we teach them how to, and then we, we expose our deal flow to them. So the last deal we did with GoSite, we were able to get like a 800,000 allocation mm -hmm. for them to put in small checks. 
you know, like $10,000 do. So not only do we teach them to invest, but we expose them to deal flow that they otherwise wouldn't have gotten access to. But yeah, we've been blogging. We originally tried to do like once or twice a week. And we were fortunate to have so many amazing LPs, investors in our fund that we, I, I've been interviewing a lot of them for the blog. And mm -hmm. um, people have been appreciative of hearing the inside stories of some of these great companies and these great leaders. Absolutely. How do you kind of manage when there's multiple LPs going on? It's not like, you know, five LPs is like, you know, a hundred or yeah. do you send like quarterly? No, we, we send, um, we send a monthly update to everyone. And then we uh, write up very detailed memos on every investment. Cause a lot of the LPs have never been in venture capital before. Mm -hmm. They're like the CRO of a big software company and they don't really <laughs> understand investing that much in the early stage. So a lot of them want to learn. Um, so we write up a very detailed memo on for each of them. We involve at least five during the due diligence process and five, at least five after on specific areas of expertise that they bring. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a quarterly LP meeting uh, and um, we always have breakouts in Zoom mm -hmm. um, so that they can collaborate in small groups on specific topics so they can learn from each other. Those are some of the things and we're still figuring it out. We're still figuring out how to like really leverage the power of this network and, and yeah. get them working together. Like you said, it, it is like a really powerful network. I don't know how you, for example, partner a particular deal with a particular LP or something. Well, that, I take the lead on that, right? Because I know I'll spend like 30 hours, 40 hours with every investment personally, right? So I dig in and talk to the salespeople, the leaders, the marketing team, look at the, like I, I do a full assessment on them. Mm -hmm. And then I'll be like, okay, like we were looking at one in the insurance space last year. And one of our LPs runs, runs the insurance division for Workday. Mm -hmm. So I don't know insurance as well as he does, but I just brought him in for a diligence call, right? So as an example. So I know what the needs are and I know what our team looks like. So then we had another one that um, they're trying to work on forecasting right now. Mm -hmm. And I know Larry D'Angelo at Log Me In mm -hmm. was the best forecaster I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. So I just get a call with him set up, right? So I know... I know what people's expertise is and I know what the concerns concerns are and I just match them up. Absolutely. I think that's super cool. Uh, I know we're about to um, hit our time. So I have three questions for you. It's a sure. little fire run. So uh -oh. one is who made the biggest impact in your career? Well, I guess it'd have to be Halligan because he, he brought me in, situated HubSpot, taught me a lot about how to be a leader at that level. Uh, so who would you invite to your dinner party? I've always been intrigued by Richard Branson. I never met him, but it's like, mm -hmm. he seems like he finds the right balance between being a great entrepreneur and having fun. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Uh, which I think a lot, when you read about some of these other entrepreneurial stories, it's like, sometimes they lack the balance in their life. Yeah. And sometimes they were just like mean people, <laughs> you know, like, and uh, I think Branson seems like his brand is walks a pretty good line between success and happiness and, and balance. Yeah. What's your favorite book beside your book? Of course. Ah, come on, I wouldn't say that. Um, I would say like for professionally, The Go-Giver is a great one that's not talked a lot mm -hmm. about. I think it's just, it does, it, it does like um, represent how I live my life, which is like, you know, when you give first, um, it's a lot easier to get when you need it without even asking. And that's kind of the go-giver kind of lives within that, that sort of trust model. For sure. Um, so where can we find you if you are not at work? Uh, I play a lot of golf and I coach my kids teams <laughs> um, and I like the beach. <laughs> nice. So I need one of those. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Mark. All right. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for tuning into Smart Venture Podcast. If you learned something from the episode or even just mildly tolerated me, please subscribe and leave a five-star rating. I promise I will keep bringing you more successful, insightful interviews and insider tips about startups. Remember, sharing is caring. So tell your friends to listen to or enemies, I won't judge. Until next time, keep venturing smartly.